How's everybody doing today? Hotep, hey, this is Michael Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is a Thursday, September 22nd, 2022. And we are. All right, so I wanted to come on for a few minutes and uh, do a brief overview of an, of an eight week online class that I teach called Ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa, understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And uh, this class is scheduled to be taught on Thursdays, normally about 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm um, session of the class today. We're gonna start about 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, it's an eight week online class. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place, okay? So those watching on Facebook and YouTube, let me know how this broadcast is coming through uh, as well. Hopefully it's coming through, uh, all right, ho hopefully it's coming through clearly and hopefully you can see me uh, pretty well. So we deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to uh, the transatlantic slave trade taking place. I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips, uh, all of that. And it, it, it if you, when you take this class, you know, you never see history and, and politics the same way. All right. Um, and we take you throughout history. We go through history chronologically as much as possible. Uh, we deal with uh, the African presence um, in the Americas going back at least 51,700 years ago. Uh, when we deal with uh, the transatlantic slave trade, we can't start our history in slavery. OK, we have to understand thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade uh, taking place. So if we look here at a brief intro to the course, uh, we can't start our history in slavery, even when we study the transatlantic slave trade, which it, which is important to important to study. We can't uh, start in 1619 or uh, 14 or in the 1440s with the Portuguese getting involved in the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, we have to deal with the 800 year island of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors and look at this history chronologically. So I've been teaching this online class um, since 2017. It has evolved immensely since 2017. I've been studying history 30 years, host of the African History Network show for 12 years. You see me on different shows, Roland Martin Unfiltered, Faraji Muhammad show, uh, the Tammy Mac um, um, Business of Being Black show on the Fox Soul Network. You see me in documentaries, et cetera. OK, uh, so. These are some of the things that we deal with in this online class. And I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, articles, video clips. I put together the curriculum for this class as well. Um, so we have to understand the history of the Moors, which helps to bring, which brings you up out of the dark ages. The Moors are taking the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, and the Nile Valley region of Africa. They're taking this into uh, Europe. Uh, which is the dark, which was the dark continent. Europe is in the dark ages. And this is going to bring Europe out of the dark ages into the Renaissance era in the uh, 1400, basically the 1400s or, or 13, we can look at late 1300s going into the 1400s, the Renaissance era. Now, this course not only deals with the transatlantic slave trade, but thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. So we can understand things chronologically, and understand cause and cause and effect. August 20th, 2019 marked the 40th year anniversary of those 20 and odd Africans or 20 and odd Negroes who came into Point Comfort August 20th, 1619 on the White Lion pirate ship in what would later be called the Colony of Virginia. Now, a lot of what we know about um, Jamestown, Virginia, things like that, a lot of that is inaccurate. So we go through and break that down and separate fact from fiction in the class. Um, this year, uh, that year was known, 2019 was known as the year of return as many African Americans reconnected to Africa and traveled to Ghana and other West African countries. When we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the original people of North, Central and South America and have been in the land that we call the United States of America at least 51,700 years. So even though the transatlantic slave trade did happen, even though slavery did exist, we have to understand that chronologically African people were here in this land that we call the United States of America 
tens of thousands of years before the transatlantic slave trade happens. We were here before Native Americans came into existence. We were here before slavery started, okay? So now this is not to um, try to take anything away from any other cultures. This is not trying to take anything away from Native Americans or any like anything like that, okay? When you study the uh, who the Native Americans are, they are the offspring of an intermixing of African people that have been in this land going back at least 51,700 years. And um, the, uh, you had Asians that came here uh, around 3000 BC, cross over the Bering Straits. They come to this land around 3000 BC. Those Africans, the Khoisan especially, who have the oldest DNA on the planet, come from Southern Africa, go all around the world. Deals with this in his book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. Those Africans intermit those Asians that were here and their offspring are who we call Native Americans. If you look at a lot of early uh, photographs of Native Americans, yes, they were black and white, but a lot of early photographs of Native Americans, they were a dark skinned people, usually a dark skinned people, high cheekbones, things like this. They, they, they were not the um, uh, very, very light skinned, almost white looking Native Americans like you see many today. OK, so it's important to understand this history. This is not saying that Native Americans didn't exist, that they were not here, anything like this. OK, but we have to understand this chronology of history. So uh, one of the things we deal with is uh, Dr. David M. Hotep is a friend of mine. Uh, I've read his book. I've interviewed him about uh, 13, 14 times on the African History Network show. Page 14 of his book lays out um, uh, a discovery that was made by Dr. Albert Goodyear in 2004. Dr. Albert Goodyear is an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina, and they found 13 different types of evidence fairly documenting an African presence in the Americas dating back at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprint, footprints in lava, uh, genetic M174D haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, uh, they found skulls, skeleton structures, and tools, 13 different types of evidence thoroughly documenting an African presence in this country going back at least 51,700 years ago. His book is backed up by 713 footnotes and seven peer-reviewed articles as well. Now, here is a, uh, so that was his first book that came out in 2011. His second book is The, uh, the First Americans Were Africans. Um, revised and expanded. The first Americans were Africans revised and expanded. That's uh, his second book that just came out in, I think, like October 2021. That's available now at Amazon.com. Now, this is this is um, an article from um, was the ScienceDaily.com, ScienceDaily.com. This is about Dr. Albert Goodyear's discovery, okay, in 2004. This article came out um, November 18th, 2004. Uh, new evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago. Now, this is a summary of uh, Dr. Albert Goodyear's article. I mean, his discovery. This is a summary of his discovery. This summary is from uh, ScienceDaily.com. It says radiocarbon tests, uh, radio tests of carbonized plant remains where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice ages. Now, a lot of our African-centered scholars, whether it's Renoko Rashidi, who's a friend of mine, we know Renoko passed away um, August 2nd, uh, 2021. Um, or whether it's Dr. Charles Finch or others, they, they've talked about uh, Homo sapiens being at least 300,000 years old, not 75,000 to 100,000 years old. So uh, this discovery here is disputed by a lot of the uh, mainstream or established archaeologists, but there's more evidence as these archaeological discoveries uh, come out. They keep having to push the timelines back. And there's more evidence showing that modern man is much older than what they originally thought. And a lot of these things, a lot of these um, structures and um, 
civilizations are much older than we were originally told. So when we talk about this, so the Khoisan is who was here at least 51,700 years ago in, in the U.S. This is who they're talking about, the Khoisan, who have the oldest D DNA on the planet. They go all around the world. They're the short statured Africans, um, and they're the ancestors to the Ainu and the Twa. Now, in October 2012, genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique and no other currently known population had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. Now, here are a couple of Khoisan women uh, as well. These are the short statute Africans. They have some uh, articles at face-to-faceafrica.com on the Khoisan also. Now, the Khoisan live mainly in Southern Africa in territory spanning Botswana, uh, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. Though, uh, some of those, by the way, were uh, colonies of Great Britain, okay? And what we do uh, in this class, and I've, I've modified the cl this class, I've added some additional information because of some current events. Uh, there's, a, there's a segment in the class already that deals with the film Black Panther and how the film Black Panther relates to African history and culture, African languages, spiritual systems, things like this. There's another component that I've added to this course that deals with the with the uh, movie The Woman King and the, some of the history of Dahomey, some of the history of those African female warriors, uh, the Agoji or uh, the Ahosi or Mino, and deal, deal with that history as well behind that and uh, the Franco Dahomeyan Wars of um, starting in 1890, 1890 through 1894, because France destroys Dahomey in 1894. So there's an additional, additional component that I've added to that because of the movie The Woman King. If you saw my three hour broadcast of the African History Network show on Sunday, September 18th, you saw we got deep into that. And then uh, this on, on this Sunday show, on uh, September 25th, we're going to get deeper into that as well. The African History Network show, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, here on Facebook and YouTube, but also on 9, 10 a.m. the Superstation WFDF here in Detroit. So this is, these are some additional components, additional information I've added to the class. But uh, with the death of Queen Elizabeth II, this has illuminated a lot of the history of British colonialism which we were already dealing with in the class, but there's more information we want to add uh, to it as well, because it, th then that dealt with uh, Queen Elizabeth of 1952, when she becomes coronated as queen. A few months after that, you see the attack uh, against the, uh, in Kenya, against the Mau Mau Rebellion. And you're going to have at least 150,000 uh, Mau Mau fighters or suspected Mau Mau fighters put into internment camps. And then it's going to be up to a total of about 1.5 million Kenyans who are going to have their movements restricted and have to have movement passes, which is, which is uh, kind of like a, the uh, South African uh, uh, passports that they had to have during apartheid in South Africa, which restricted the movements of Africans. And uh, you're going to have um, th those Africans in the, those internment camps. They're going to be tortured, African men beaten, castrated, uh, raped, as well as African women raped also. OK, so all this is going to take place. And we look at um, we'll, we'll look at a map to see all of the uh, countries that uh, Great Britain conquered because in, in 1952, a little more than 25% of the world population lived under British rule, okay, at a time when the U.S. population was 2. Point, the, the, at a time when the world population was 2.5 billion, more than 700 million people lived under British rule. So you have to ask the question, okay, you have to ask the question, how did this uh, one little raggedy ass country, England, how did they conquer more than 25% of the world population? Okay, so we go into history to see this. All right, uh, so uh, the Khoisan live mainly in uh, Southern Africa and territory spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. Now, Botswana, um, uh, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa 
those were all colonies of Great Britain. Great Britain got those colonies at the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885. So understanding is that African history, the Berlin Conference is something uh, extremely important to understand. And we'll deal with that some. We talk about that some in this class, but the second class that I teach um, is uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. And it definitely deals with that period of history uh dealing with the uh, berlin conference because that falls within that timeline uh 1884 to 1885 so we talk about that some in our second class um that i teach but definitely in this first class we'll deal with that as well now the khoisan are largely divided into two groups hunters and gatherers uh known as the sans people s-a-n-s and keepers of livestock known as the khoi khoi people the the khoisan languages include uh, the distinctive click sounds that are not found in the languages of their neighbors. There's a good article from AtlantaBlackStar.com called Five Ethnic Groups That Prove the First Humans Were Black. OK, now um, you can register for this online class uh, right now. We posted the link here on the thread of the broadcast and it's in the description here. But we also have the information on the home page uh, of our website, TheAfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, the African History Network.com. Okay. So when you scroll down the page, you'll see the information there for the class. Just click on register here and you can register for it. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. So you can go back and watch it anytime. Here, here I am at the radio station, 9 10 a.m. the superstation WFDF here in Detroit. My show has been on uh, the African History Network show. We've been on Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. for six years. Uh, you scroll down. Here's one of my broadcasts I did dealing with uh, Queen Elizabeth II, British colonialism, and hundreds of years of uh, slavery. Uh, yep, yeah, uh, hundreds of years of slavery and no reparations. So you click there, watch that on YouTube. So we have information here for the class Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'a for understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Classes on sale, um, uh, classes on sale $80, regularly $130. Uh, so we're going to have class today. Uh, we'll start as soon as I finish this broadcast. We'll start about 7.30 or so. Click right here to register here. It takes you to the next page. And when we go here to the next page, just click on um, register. It takes you to our Learn World page. Okay, it takes you to Learn World. Click on Enroll. Okay, right there. And just follow the prompts. So you can start watching the class. You can join us in class live. Um we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. So you can go back and watch the class anytime, even a year from now, two years from now, you'll still have access to the full class. You can watch as many times as you want to. I would say the content is PG-13. You can use this information with your children also. Uh, the second class that I teach is um, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. Uh, we had a short class on Tuesday. Normally we do this class on Tuesday, 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, but uh, we're going to have, have a good makeup class, uh, which is going to be Friday, September 23rd, 30 p.m. to 10 p.m. And that class is on sale $80 as well. If you can't join us in class live, that's fine. And we have a bundle pack here. Uh, you get both classes for $130. That's over $300 value. Click right here to register for that. If you've taken any of my online classes in the past, email me. You can email me right through the website. Click on contact the African History Network and you'll get a 50% discount. OK. All right. So uh, some other things we deal with uh, in the class. Uh, we deal with a ton of history. I was somebody in school when I was in high school. I did not like history. I did not like world history. I did not like American history. Uh, cause it wasn't taught from an African centered or African American perspective. It was in college, uh, that I really started studying African history, things like that, especially when the movie Malcolm X came out in 1992. Uh, so I've been studying in 30 years. Um, so we'll look at, um, some work from Dr. David M. Hotep as well. We look at different archeological discoveries that are causing, uh, the scientists, anthropologists, paleontologists to rethink everything and push the timelines back. The deeper they dig, the black, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. So this discovery right here blew a lot of people away, came out in uh, February 2010. New York Times had an article on Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners, on Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. Uh, over the course of two summers, archaeologists um, did excavations, did digs in um, 
on the Greek island of Crete, which has been an island for more than five million years. And they found stone tools that date back at least 130,000 years ago. Stone tools that date back 130,000 years ago, at least, which is considered strong evidence for the earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures. Now, Crete has been an island for more than five million years, meaning that the tool makers must have arrived by boat, meaning that the tool makers must have arrived by boat. Now, Previous artifact discoveries has shown people reaching Cyprus and few and uh, a few other uh, Greek islands and possibly Sardinia no earlier than 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. So this puts a, a, a human presence on the Greek island of Crete 100,000 years before that, which is serving as strong evidence that they were sailing there. OK, all all of this is much older than what we've been told. And as more archaeological discoveries come out, it's becoming harder to keep pushing the lies. It's becoming harder to keep pushing the lies. We deal with uh, two lost cities of Egypt. One, Thomas Heraklion, that um, was built around 8th century BC and fell into uh, the sea about 1,200 years ago. Thomas Heraklion. Okay, information about that discovery came out in 2013. Here's some of the 16 foot tall statues they found. Uh, at, the, at the bottom of the sea from this uh, from this ancient Egyptian city that um, existed basically only on paper before uh, that discovery was made. OK, then we look at discoveries like this one here that came out of Morocco in June of 2017 that uh, uh, pushes the origin of humans, home, uh, modern man, at least 100,000 years ago because they found um, skeletal remains of Homo sapiens that date back between 300,000 to 350,000 years ago. Okay. Now, the oldest human remains of, of modern man, Homo sapiens, the oldest remains of Homo sapiens they had prior to that were discovered in Ethiopia in 1974. They dated back 195,000 years ago. These here in Morocco totally blew everybody away, was causing them to have to rethink everything, and, and it dealt with earlier migrations out of the Nile Valley region of Africa over 100,000 years be prior to what they originally thought. So when these, when these discoveries come out, the archaeologists and scientists, everything, they're just sitting there dumbfounded. Many of them, they're just sitting there dumbfounded. Okay. The deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get. Then you look at things like the... Um, uh, let's see what we want to go to next. Well, we look at the Mastodon uh, bone findings uh, in April 2017 in California. And with this discovery here, they're saying that these Mastodon skeletons were uh, bro were, were uh, broken up by humans. And they date the skeletons back 130,000 years ago. Okay. Uh, Mastodon bone findings could up in our understanding of human history. Now, Dr. David M. Hotep, Renoka Rashidi, Dr. Charles Finch, they've been talking about um, an African, pre well, especially um, Dr. David M. Hotep has been talking about an African presence here. Uh, well, Homo sapiens being at least 300,000 years old, number one. Number two, when you look at this discovery, the uranium dating puts the site at around 130,000 years ago. When you look at this discovery, they're saying that these bone remains were, were smashed apart approximately 100,000 years ago by humans in California. Paleontologists have dug up a 130,000-year-old Mastodon skeleton that looks like it was smashed apart by humans, but they found it in America where people were not supposed to have arrived for another 100,000 years. Talking about the Clovis culture discovery in New Mexico that dates back about, about 13,000, 14,000 uh, BC. Okay. That's looked at as the oldest uh, evidence of, uh, of Homo sapiens, of, of modern man in North America. Okay. Clovis culture. All right. But, they, they, but there's the African presence. There's a presence of humans going back at least 51,700 years ago in uh, Allendale County, South Carolina, which Dr. David M. Hotel deals with his book in the first Americans for Africans documented evidence. But this discovery right here, these are these are these are white archaeologists. 
and paleontologists who made this discovery. And if this is true, they're saying that puts a human presence in a, 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 a homo sapiens, modern man, in California 130,000 years ago. So the question has to be asked, okay, who were these modern, who, who were these homo sapiens? They weren't Europeans. They weren't Native Americans. They weren't Asians. Who were they? These, these were African people. These, these would be the Khoisan. The deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets. The more research they do, the older we get. These archaeological, archaeological discoveries are coming out every other week. There's so many, I can't keep up with them. There's new discoveries coming out every other week. Okay? All right, so we have a section in class. We look at archaeological discoveries because we're going to talk about some in today's class as soon as I get finished with this. Uh, we talk about the Olmex as well. Uh, in Mexico, we look at some different, briefly look at some different African civilizations, ancient civilizations. Uh, we look at the uh the influence on the united states from africa especially ancient africa because we know that 50 of the 56 signers of the declaration of independence were freemasons and we know that the foundation of freemasonry are the teachings coming out of ancient kemet and the mystery schools the mystery systems when we look at the tekken the ten is a ancient African symbol of resurrection coming from the uh, mythology of Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. The Washington Monument is an ancient African symbol, the Tekken. The Greeks call it an obelisk. We see Tekkenu, Tekkenu for plural. We see Tekkenu in uh, New York City, London, England, and Paris, France. And these Tekkenu come from Egypt, come from Kemet, ancient Kemet. Ancient Egyptians called obelisks Tekkenu, and they were also used to tell the time in the past. Their pinnacles were basically covered in gold to reflect the sunlight. Historians say the obelisks represented immortality and eternity, and their long structure helped connect the heavens and the earth. Now, currently, Cleopatra's needle is the name given to three ancient Egyptian obelisks, or Tekkenu, one in New York City, one in London, England, and one in Paris, France. However, they did not come from one Egyptian site. The obelisks in New York and London are carved out of red granite from the quarries of Aswan, a major source of stone for Egyptian antiquities. The two obelisks were commissioned by Nasubiti or Pharaoh Thutmose III for the Temple of the Sun of Heliopolis near modern-day Cairo. Uh, with each weighing about 224 tons and 68 feet tall. There's a good article from facetofaceafrica.com called Cleopatra's Needle, how three ancient Egyptian obelisks ended up in New York City, London, and, and France. So and what happens is African culture has influenced architecture around the world, especially in Greece and Rome, uh, but also throughout Europe. But we see this influence here in the U.S., but what happens is because we've been stripped of African history and culture, they can hijack our culture and show us symbols of our culture. And we have been so cut off from it. We don't understand how to decode the symbols. So when you when you see a Tekken, that's us. And you see you see those Tekkens also the, the Tekken new you'll see those in um, cemeteries as well. When we see the Washington Monument, that's African. That's African. But. If you've been if you've been taught that you're not an African, and you've been taught to hate Africa, then you won't run away from what our ancestors created while everybody else is running to it. If we look at this um, here, how's everybody doing? How y'all like this type of information? Now let me know. Can you all hear me clearly? Can you see me clearly? Everything should run uh, be working well because I'm back on Xfinity uh for this uh high priced internet service as well so everything should be working fine this internet service costs 99 dollars a month with a nine dollar discount okay <laughs> this <laughs> that's xfinity all right i got like the extreme 600 package okay so there were um so the uh there were approximately 1200 tech new built in ancient kemet but only about a dozen are found 
in Egypt today. Many of the Tekkenu removed from Egypt are now in Istanbul, Turkey, London, England, Paris, France, Berlin, Germany, New York, New York, Rome, Italy, Vatican City, and elsewhere throughout the world. The, the Tekkenu are now called obelisks by their new owners, and few know their origin or that they symbolize the resurrection of the African king Asar. If you read page 17 of Egypt on a Potomac by Tony Brown, now this is one of the books that we use in the class. You don't have to buy any of these books. I show you different excerpts of them. Uh, but if you read Egypt on a Potomac by Tony Browder, he deals with this in the book. And we're going to have, uh, I talked to Browder before he went to Africa. He's at an education summit in Africa now, in South Africa. And uh, when he comes back, I'm going to have him on my show to talk about the uh, film, The Woman King as well. Now, the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. The term term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Masonic temples, many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. Read pages 13, uh, page 18 and 32 of Egypt on the Potomac, broader breaks that down there. So the concept of going to an institution of higher learning and getting your uh, credentials in a series of steps or degrees, that that's African, that comes out of ancient Kemet. Associate's degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD. The concept of liberal arts colleges comes out of ancient Kemet as well, comes out of ancient Africa. Um, if you read um, Stolen Legacy by G George G.M. James, uh, George G.M. James, um, uh, Greek philosophy is stolen African philosophy. Uh, still in Egyptian philosophy. If you read that book, he deals with the uh, the seven liberal arts, the rhetoric and the logic and arithmetic, things like that. Okay. So uh, those are some of the things we deal with. And then we deal with um, uh, the Black Madonna and Child coming from Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. We look at some of the uh, um, African deities, some of the uh, Neturu, uh, as well, like Ma'at and Offset, things like this, Bastet uh, as well. Uh, we look at the uh, origins of St. Nicholas, uh, what becomes Santa Claus coming from St. Nicholas and then center class. That is because uh, St. Nicholas was an African uh, saint. OK, he was an African person. A lot of your early Christian saints were Africans as well. Early Christianity before the Council of the Nicaea in 325 AD, early Christianity looked a lot like traditional African spiritual systems. We will we'll look at things like center class who had a uh, who was um, uh, center class was celebrated uh, in the Netherlands. OK. And in Holland and uh, center class is Dutch, which means St. Nicholas. OK. Center class was a figure, a religious figure that wore a red cape and, and a white outfit with a, a red and white hat, okay? And he had a sidekick named Joata Piet. Joata Piet means Black Pete. Black Pete was a Moor, all right? Uh, and center class is going to be transformed. Center class is brought to this country by the Dutch in the early 1700s. And th that figure of center class is gonna be transformed into the secular figure of Santa Claus is largely going to be the cartoonist Thomas Nast, who uh, for Harper's Bazaar Weekly is going to draw this uh, image of what we know as Santa Claus that was largely created by Thomas Nast. And then you have the uh, poem, A Visit from St. Nicholas by Clement Clark Moore, Twice the Night Before Christmas and All Through the House, Not a Creature Was Stirring at Even a Mouse. That helps to popularize this, this image of Santa Claus that's brought to this country by the Dutch. OK, so so we deal with some of that history because that then ties into the history of the Moors and the Moors being conquered as well. This is a three hour lecture that I've done dealing with the, the origins of Christmas and the pre-Christian origins of Christmas. So we deal with everything from uh, African deities, uh, you know, Neturu, like Osset, uh, Asar, Osset and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis and Horus. We look at evidence of African people here. 
uh, before uh, Columbus even comes to North America. The, the, uh, Columbus never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. The, the closest he comes here is Cuba, which is 90 miles away. And uh, he it, it's, it's extremely important to uh, understand Christopher Columbus because those island nations that he conquered have never recovered from what happened to them over 500 years ago. H uh, Haiti, H Hispaniola, Haiti's on the, the western third of the island of Hispaniola. That was conquered by uh, uh, Columbus on behalf of the uh, Spanish crown in uh, 1492. Okay, he goes on four voyages, 1492 to 1504. He dies in 1506. If you look at where Columbus goes, he never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. So first we need to stop saying he came here because he did not, number one. Okay, the closest he comes here is Cuba, which is about 90 miles away. Number two, he did not discover America. I think most right thinking people know that. They were already people uh, where he went and about 70% of the people uh, he came in contact with were African people because we were already in a lot of those areas. But if you look at uh, countries like uh, Cuba, Haiti, Hispaniola, St. Dominique, uh, Dominican Republic, uh, the Bahamas, um, Puerto, Puerto Rico, Jamaica. Okay. These are all nations that were conquered by Columbus, Panama, Honduras. They've never recovered from what happened to them over 500 years ago. Then Jamaica gets hijacked in 1655 by the British. Okay. Cause the British go to war with Spain. They hijacked Jamaica in 1655 and, and Jamaica becomes a British colony. OK, after it was a Spanish colony, um, we know with Haiti, OK, uh, Haiti, OK, with the uh, Taino called Haiti, we know with, with them that was a Spanish colony that becomes a French colony in 1697. The French get uh, hate um, uh, what they call um, Saint Dominique. They get that from uh, Spain in 1697. That becomes the most that basically the most uh, uh, lucrative uh, colony, uh, most, most wealth producing colony that um, uh, France has, okay? So Columbus is crucial to understanding the expansion of slavery. Uh, he, helps, he helps to lay the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism, exploitation of indigenous people. And Columbus's voyages are going to lead to uh, what's known as the Asiento de Negros of um, 1518, August of 1518, signed by King Charles V, which gives a license, uh, gives a monopoly to slave trading uh, nations and slave traders to provide uh, enslaved Africans to Spanish colonies. OK, that's the Asiento de Negros. That's extremely important. To, we would deal with, you know, the doctrine of discovery, dumb to verses uh, 1452. But the, but the Asiento, uh, what this does is drastically expands the transatlantic slave trade and brings about direct voyages from Africa to their final destination, as opposed to them having to stop in Spain first. And we know that um, it's going to be Bartolome de las Casas, right, Reverend Bishop Bartolome de las Casas who goes along with Columbus on some of his voyages, he's going to uh, uh, advocate to the uh, Spanish crown and to the Pope that they should stop enslaving uh, what we call Native Americans, the Taino and Arawaks, things like this. They should stop enslaving them and try to save their souls because their populations were being decimated and to shift to exclusively uh, enslaving African people and to a lesser extent, some Europeans, okay? And this is what they're going to do. That was Bartolomeu de las Casas who advocated for that. Now, he then changes his position and works to abolish the slave trade, but well, hell, you, it's too late then, okay? He's one of the most important, when we study the transatlantic slave trade, Christopher Columbus, Bartolomeu de las Casas, King Charles V, these are three of the most important Europeans that we're going to see because Spain, um, they're the second ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade. Portugal are the first ones involved 
in 14, about 1441. Spain are the second ones involved. And if you look where Spain and Portugal are, okay, you see that they're right next to each other. Let me see. Do I have my map here? Yeah, we have the of uh, Al Andalus. Okay, so all this is this, so, so in the class we deal with geography, we deal with different African civilizations. We look at the chronology of history. It's important to understand this geography because when the Moors go into um, the Iberian Peninsula, today known as Spain and Portugal, in 711 AD, we look at where Portugal and Spain are. They're right above Morocco. It's a very short distance between the two. Okay. And we know these Africans, they're going to intermix into the European populations, but Spain and Portugal gets the brunt of that. That's why the um, complexion of like the Spanish and Portuguese are, are usually darker, generally speaking, than that of, of those uh, than the English and the Germans and Austria, because they're further away from uh, where Morocco is. OK, they, they, they get that intermixing some, but not as much as uh, Italy spain portugal sicily things like that they get it to a much greater extent so we look at who the moors were as well and what they introduced into europe and and how this helps bring europe out of the dark ages we look at uh, Tariq ibn Ziyad in 711 a.d going into uh, the iberian peninsula and tarif the the general tarif in 710 a.d on a reconnaissance mission uh, the Moors invade in 711 AD, where they land at, uh, that mountain is called Tariq's Mountain, Jebel Tariq, or what we call Gibraltar. Gibraltar, the rock of Gibraltar comes from Jebel Tariq, which was named after General Tariq Ibn Ziyad. This is where they, this is where they land. So we take you throughout history. We look at everything from the film Black Panther and uh, how the film Black Panther relates to African history, African culture, uh, African language spiritual systems etc the movie's a deep movie on multiple levels uh, uh the film black panther and that's why i'm wearing my black panther shirt as well uh we look at uh the punic wars and hannibal barca uh the carthaginians fighting against uh rome and Publius Cornelius scipio africanus um and bastet the, the panther deity of bast who we see in the film black panther comes from bastet okay which is a uh, um a, a netter, a deity in ancient Kemet, uh, that was originally, um, th that was a, a female deity with the head of a um, lioness uh, first, and then later a cat. Okay, and this was a black lioness, and then later a black cat. Um, this is Bastet, who is a uh, deity of warfare, a, ne a, a netter of warfare in Lower Kemet. So the panther deity in black panther called bast okay that comes from bastet there's so much in that movie that deals with african history and culture and language spiritual systems things like that we deal with you know understanding more about bantu languages because the word wakanda we see that in key congo key congo languages is referenced to uh, family but wakanda is also um in omaha ponka and osaji languages and it, it, it basically uh refers to um it basically means possesses secret powers possesses secret powers but it's also in reference to god as well wakanda is the great creator power of the osaji omaha and ponca tribes wakanda is an abstract omnipresent creative force who is never personified in traditional suan legends and in fact did not even have a gender before the introduction of english with its gender specific nouns now what's interesting is in wisconsin there is a wakanda water park in wisconsin it's spelled just like in the movie w-a-k-a-n-d-a -A -A. it's been there for decades they, ain't, they didn't create the park after the movie black panther came out february 16 2018 no that, that's been there for decades okay um so these are just some of the things we deal with in the class if you learn anything from this broadcast uh if you like this how y'all like this type of information how many people learned uh uh something or a lot from this broadcast uh be sure to register for this eight week online class we, i'm going to teach you another installment uh right now normally do this on thursdays 7 p.m to 8 p.m eastern 7 p.m to 9 p.m eastern standard time so we're running a little late today because I, I my work schedule was screwed up so i just got home recently uh um just got home from work um shortly uh a little while ago 
Uh, the class is on sale $80, regularly $130. We posted the link here on the thread of the broadcast. And we also have the information at our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Scroll down the page, click on register here. We have the information here. Then on the next page, just click on enroll. You can join us in class. We have a bundle pack. We can register for both classes I teach for $130. That's over $300 value. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded, so you can watch the class on demand. So if you can't watch it till four o'clock in the morning or something like that, not a problem. That's fine. OK. OK, look, we have to get out of here. Also, oh, you can support the African History Network also through uh, PayPal and Cash App. We definitely need your support. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App and through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills because uh, that definitely that support definitely helps out. Because even though I'm on radio and on Roland Martin's show and doing this and that, I don't get paid for none of that stuff. I've been doing radio 12 years. I don't get paid to do radio or anything. So we have to uh, monetize it. So this helps to finance the African History Network. Okay, look, I have to get out of here. We're about to teach this class. You can register for the class now. Join us in class. Uh, right now, it's correct. Wrong behavior is not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk.